going Dutch. A populist movement puts traditional politics to the test once again as voters head to the polls in the Netherlands. We'll ask why people are abandoning traditional parties and what the result could mean for nervous European neighbours. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. The world is watching to see if the Netherlands plays host to the next populist uprising following the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump. Around 13 million people face a dizzying choice between a record number of parties in the country's general election, with vast numbers choosing to abandon traditional mainstream parties. In this programme, we'll discuss the Dutch vote and what's driving people to polarised politics. But first, Insight's Simon McGregor Wood sent this report from the Netherlands. There are 28 parties competing in these elections, but only one of them is grabbing the world's attention. Gert Wilders and his Freedom Party could become the biggest in Parliament. As ever, he pulls no punches, whether on Twitter or on the street. Uncompromisingly anti-immigrant, anti-Islam, anti-EU and anti-elite. Once again, not all are scum, but there is a lot of Moroccan scum in Holland who makes the streets unsafe. Mostly, mostly, young, mostly young people, and they are, they are not taken seriously. In a year of crucial European elections, the Dutch are the first to go to the polls. First it was Brexit, then Trump. Could Wilders provide the next populist shock? Alexandra Lammers and Ronald Mullendick are Wilders voters through and through. They live in Eiburg, a new suburb of Amsterdam. The neighbourhood has 50% social housing. The majority are immigrants, Moroccans, Turks and others. Alexandra and Ronald say they've had enough and claim they're not alone. What do you say to the critics, the usual criticisms? If he's a racist and if this is racism, then I'm proud to be a racist. He's not a racing, he's addressing problems with Moroccans, and Moroccans are not a race, so it's, he's not a racist. Wilders has done well in the polls before, but his vote usually falls short in elections. Now that may not happen this time, which would make him far more difficult to ignore. But for some, he has already succeeded. The guy's not interested in really governing and taking responsibility at all. What he's interested in is letting mainstream right-wing parties, the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, talk about his issues and taking what his policies, because they will be implemented. He won't have the responsibility and it will happen anyway. He's already won the elections. On Monday night, he went head-to-head -head with Prime Minister Mark Rutte on national television. And it is not to stop. And 11% of Muslims in the Netherlands, that's 100,000 people, let me finish, say that it's justified in the Netherlands to use violence in the name of Islam. If you're not willing to see that, you're a danger. For Mark Rutte, Wilders is the main challenge, and on Monday, warned Dutch voters against complacency. Remember the Brexit. We all thought that would never happen. Remember the US elections. So let's not make that mistake again. These elections are crucial. Let us stop the domino effect. Right here, this week, this Wednesday. The domino effect of the wrong sort of populism winning in this world. For some, the Wilders effect explains his tough stance in the diplomatic crisis with Turkey, fearing compromise might lose votes. Whatever happens, he, like other party leaders, says he will not form a coalition government with Wilders. That may be more easily said than done. This is Schwildersvik in The Hague, for 40 years the home to a large immigrant and mainly Muslim population. is. Bendekok has been teaching here for all that time. He says people are used to Wilders' inflammatory rhetoric. It's not so different this time. 
and he is confident Dutch traditions of liberalism and tolerance will prevail. And when I walk in this environment, and of course I, I work here, and I walk a lot in this environment, I see, I, I, I'm, I'm proud on, on, on this here. I'm proud what the community uh, has realized here. And I am, I'm sure, I'm, I'm convinced that what we have now, no one will break down. I think it will, it will stay like, like, like here. Some Dutch voters are bemused by the world's fixation with builders. They say most people will vote as they do elsewhere, for better jobs, health care, public services and more euros in their pocket. However well Wilders does, this week's election will probably produce a confusing patchwork of different political parties in the Dutch Parliament. And on Thursday morning, long and difficult coalition negotiations will begin, with or without Gert Wilders. I'm Simon McGregorwood reporting for Insight from the Netherlands. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Sami Hamdi, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of an online current affairs analysis and opinion magazine called International Interest. And also with us is Ben Margulis from the University of Warwick, who specialises in European politics. Ben, we heard about a domino effect. Can it be stopped in the Netherlands? Well, I mean... I don't think it's very likely. The international press has tended to overstate uh, how likely it is Geert Wilders will win. They tend to underplay the Dutch dynamic where you're going to have, as Mr. McGregor Wood said, at least a dozen parties in Parliament. So it, it's not the same thing as winning a single issue referendum or winning a presidential election. The fact is that Wilders may win 10, 15 percent of the vote, uh, 20 at the outside, but he's not going to, uh, claims that he's going to become prime minister are probably overstated. I think uh, the gentleman your journalist interviewed was quite correct in saying that his real impact has been affecting what issues are discussed, and it's not that likely that he's going to win power. So if there is a domino effect, it's not so much that the Dutch will stop it, it's that it's actually not really relevant there. The next domino, if any, would probably be France. Well, let's just not underplay the underdog. We were wrong about mm. Brexit, or many commentators were, weren't they? People said it would never mm. happen. They said Donald Trump would never be elected. It could yet happen, could it not? Um, it could uh, definitely happen. I mean, he's being portrayed now as a serious candidate. Previously in the past, these sort of candidates used to be portrayed as comedic, as jokes, as, as the like. This time, it seems, he's head-to-head -head with the Prime Minister on national TV having a debate. I mean, mm. to the people, he's now looking like he's on a par with the Prime Minister. Also, when you look at the Trump effect, Trump in the US, when he set the agenda, all of the other candidates are responding to what Trump said, what Trump did, what Trump was going to talk about, and the like, until it became such that Trump was the main man on the political scene. Now, the problem with, uh, with Gert Wilders is not necessarily the fact whether he wins or not, but the fact of the matter is he has really exacerbated social tensions within Dutch society. And no matter how much we reiterate about liberal values and tolerance, if you say something enough times, it eventually becomes the truth. Mm. If he's saying 11% of Muslims believe that this violence should be used to spread their cause, you say it once, you say it twice, you say it three times until the Dutch population say, maybe that's true, I should go check this out. So all of a sudden, that's altered the social dynamic between the Muslim community and between well, the Dutch. It's also the political discourse, isn't it? Because it means his opponents have to respond. They have to have an answer to that. They I have to the, deny it. They have to refute it. I think the biggest example of that, or the biggest proof of that, is the way the Prime Minister took such a strong stance against uh, Turkey with regards to ban the foreign minister from uh, landing and the like. That's not typically the Prime Minister's style. I mean, that's more as if this is a last-ditch attempt that I might not get the result I want. So let me at least try to poach some populist votes from Gert Wilders by appearing strong. The fact of the matter is, however way you look at it, he ceded ground to Gert Wilders by acknowledging this particular crisis. Of course, that's suggesting that the alternative is to ignore it, which you can't ignore it. The fact of the matter is, the way the global order is now, you cannot ignore such issues anymore. Um, 
Ben Margulies, did he exacerbate the problem? I've seen one opinion poll as we record our programme that suggests the Prime Minister has benefited with this disagreement with Turkey. I've also seen an opinion poll suggesting he suffered because of it. What do you think? I think his definite strategy was to attempt to you know, put to steel wielders thunder, which is actually quite common mm. with mainstream parties. And uh, Mr. Hamdi is, is right that, you know, the, Wilder's main influence is that he affects the debate in this way. It's hard to say, I mean, I think it would be hard to say, given how short the time frame is in just a few days, how much this will help him or not, or to untangle uh, the particular impact of the, the Turkey dispute from all the other dynamics in the election. A lot of Dutch voters are undecided. Uh, Wilders has actually been falling in the polls a little for uh, other reasons. So it's, it's difficult to say what the precise impact is, but I definitely uh, agree with Mr. Hamdi that he's probably trying to either steal populist votes or simply make Wilders appear unnecessary through, through taking a hard line towards Turkey. Uh, ben, we've got a, just one snapshot of how undecided everybody is. It's not uh, science particularly, but it's a, a Google Trends graph I've got here of the search terms that people have been using over the last few days. And you see the sort of chaotic nature of where the parties are going up and down in support. Even the Green Party, which doesn't normally end up with many representations in Parliament, uh, mm -hmm. enjoying a brief moment as the most searched. And then uh, the P Prime Minister's Party, the VVD, actually re reasserting itself as position two in the chart. Mm -hmm. It does suggest, doesn't it, that the discourse this time has been confusing. But given the fact that we think Holland will end up with a coalition, as it has done for the last number of decades, and then you exclude from a coalition, typically, the parties that don't get enough or don't want to join the coalition because you cannot agree. If you exclude uh, all Mr Wilder's supporters from the next few years of government, doesn't that create a problem? It might. Uh, by the main threat from excluding Wilders from government and his uh, supporters from government is allows Wilders to pose as the opposition and it really reinforces this frame that he uses, that all populists use, use that uh, he represents this pure, genuine Dutch people against this elite conspiracy of corruption and weakness that is ranged against him. So by excluding him, uh, they allow him to remain politically pure, they allow him uh, to pose as the sole genuine opposition or almost the sole genuine opposition, that's the threat that he would grow stronger in opposition. Uh, alternatively, it may be that he will eventually be seen as ineffective and some other opposition party will uh, come along and steal his thunder. It's not sure. The main threat is his exclusion will allow him to pose as this uh, single opposition leader and further alienate his voters. The so that hand, is so a problem. On the other hand, Sammy, if he is excluded, that sort of parks the issue. It's a rejection, isn't it, by the Dutch people of his philosophy, however popular it may be this week, and the country can get on with its more middle ground, middle road approach to life. Look, it, it, it's a double-edged sword at the end of the day. If you bring him into power, he seems as a credible politician capable of governing. Right now, uh, I, I think Theresa May said to Jeremy Corbyn that, you know, he knows how to lead a protest, I know how to lead a government. You know, I mean, it, it, it's kind of that difference. You take him out of the protest field into governance. That can work two ways. He can either look ineffective or he can look as a genuine uh, or, or, or capable uh, technocrat in government. Uh, keep him on the opposition, it's true, he may become the key opposition figure. My point is that either way, there are negatives that can be taken from including him and excluding him. But I think the key issue is we are going from the, uh, from the basis that Gert Wilders is the representative of these people. We're not looking at the dynamics that have created the situation in the first place, which is that you have a government that talks about economic growth and, you know, these numbers and GDP, but the real economy is that people are still suffering. Now, if you solve those problems, Gerd Wilders rhetoric suddenly becomes redundant because people suddenly are better off and they say, OK, Gerd Wilders, you may have a point on the immigrants, but my life is a bit comfortable. I'm not ready yeah. to give that up, so I'm going to vote for that party. So I think... Let's examine that and some of the other aspects of this election, some of the big themes, when we continue our conversation. More on the Dutch election in part two of Insight. Stay with us.